Saren Knudsen. Yes. Welcome to the podcast. Oh, thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Nice to have you here. You, you're the, um, the friendly neighborhood OT security expert in Denmark. Oh, yes. And One of the few. Yeah, and in, oh. in Norway as well. I actually work a lot in Norway as well. In Norway so, as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, the friendly neighborhood then, yeah. <laughs> just, in, just around the neighborhood. <laughs> yeah. And uh, rumor has it, um, well, I know you're going to speak at the conference, and rumor has it you have some uh, new research. It was actually an idea I come up with uh, the war in, uh, in Ukraine. Uh, so it has a relation to that. Um, Interesting. Can you give us a sneak peek or is it top secret? No, no, no. It's, it, I can give you a sneak peek. The title is, should we have a factory in Russia? Uh, so, uh, yeah, so you can have almost guess, uh, think about it, but it's the may idea that come up when Russia started to, there was more and more companies that wanted to get out of Russia for their production, but mm. The politics from Putin was that they will take over the factory, which has a lot of in intellectual properties and different stuff like that. Oh, yeah. And then the second one was, how can we actually kill the PLCs? So what do it as unusable as possible when a company is kind of uh, trying to exit Russia? So let's say that a company wow. want to exit but has a problem. Uh, but at the same time, when you exit, you don't only want to delete your configuration, you want to make all your PLTs as difficult as possible to reuse. So what we call a brick PLC, which make it unusable. But I'll also discuss a bit about what is actually a brick PLC. And is it that bricked or can it be restored? And, and, and mm. sometimes how. But the most important is for me is actually to give some inspiration about companies that might sitting in a dilemma that they actually want to go out, but can't due to that uh, it has a big impact for them, only, or not only on the business, but yeah, it will be copied. Mm. And later the IP, the intellectual property will be misused and they will just go on. So. So the idea is actually to figure out how can we do this as difficult as possible for Russia to reuse the equipment. And when there is the embargo, it will be more difficult for Russia to import a new equipment. So it has a higher degree of what, how, 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 how bad can we kill it basically. It's kind of like if I reformat my PC, you can kind of still go in there and get what was there before, right? Yeah, not so, only that, but you can reuse right? it. You can install a new Windows. But what if I mm. can kill it so hard that you need to open it and put new chips in? Because mm. so, so can I go? Yeah. How far can we go? And yeah, in which situation? And I want to create it as not only for one vendor, but kind of getting the more the, the way as a standard or not a standard, but a method to, to do it. And it has nothing to do with vulnerabilities from the PLC from the vendors, actually, because this is you have full access, you all love the software, but how mm. can you do it and make it as difficult as for reuse as possible? So that's pretty that's much. funny, though, you're basically doing the exact thing that you've been trying to protect against for all these years, <laughs> almost. Yeah, uh, like, uh, I think it was fun because uh, it tried it and it, it's, it's not only to show how it is, but give some inspiration for companies that might have mm. a different way to think of it and said, we can't yeah. do it, it's for too difficult or what kind of, so, so give some inspiration, give some ideas of is it possible or mm. and how is it possible? Mm. Cool. Well, I'm looking forward to that. I'm sure you're going to get lots of questions. You're going to be a very popular man at the bar afterwards. <laughs> so it's just kind of a different way to look at it. Normally, we look at how we protect this. Right now, I kind of, how yeah. can I destroy my own thing? Right. So, but Fun. It's, Fun. It has a different aspect. Cool. Yeah. Well, Mr. Knudsen, I'm looking forward to it. Mm -hmm. I'll see you then. Yeah. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Ciao. Ciao. Tibor Fredersi. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Ah, welcome back to the podcast. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. You are going to uh, travel to CTI land here in November. Yes, that's correct. So the title of my presentation is 
lessons learned in City Ireland. And I will tell some interesting stories from the past five years, like figuring out what you need, an expensive only solution or just some specific tailored services. You know, the price difference could be huge, not to mention the amount of time required to get some value out of your investment and just how to justify cyber stock investment with cyber threat intel. This is a good one because, uh, you know, building business cases is where CTI can really shine. And the third one, I think that's one of the biggest one, is how to manage expectations when manager ma managers want you to predict the future. You just simply cannot, but it's always a long conversation about the requirements and receiving feedback and making sure that everyone is happy when the reports are delivered. So yeah, you know, mm. lots of valuable lessons and the stories from the field. And I hope the audience will be happy to hear these. Yeah, because over the past five years, you worked for at least two different companies, right? No, it's the same company, actually. We just had a big merger okay. almost two years, like two years ago. Yeah. Yeah. So over those years, you've worked with a lot of different, um, I'm going to say like technology vendors, but also like managed security providers with, with uh, threat intelligence in CTI land, correct? Oh, yeah. Like, uh, I think I can say that... Uh, we work with many providers, so we try different mm. things. And uh, I, I really think that, you know, the, the community can learn from our mistakes and also successes. So that's why uh, I plan to share these great stories so everyone can learn from mm. it. Can you say anything about the difference between, you know, like um, consuming threat intelligence like uh, as like a software service compared to consuming it as from like a consulting perspective? if you've experienced those two differences? Oh yeah, so basically the big difference is that no matter what, you still need to spend a lot of time and effort to get some value from uh, cyber, threat, uh, cyber threat in the services. But the thing is that if you ask for uh, like a professional service that can help you like tailor the your needs and help you figure out what you really need, then it's uh, you will get value much faster from your investment because uh, Let's say ju you just buy a big service and you don't uh, receive any additional human service to that, then you need insane amount of working hours to mm. get something out of it. And uh, it's just, just something that you will figure out when you're actually there. So no one can really prepare mm. you for that. Mm. Would you say that if uh, you subscribe to some like TI service, which just gives you a bunch of lists and stuff, you kind of have to have your own in-house Oh, yeah. Analyst to digest oh, yeah. it. So like, it. Yeah. Yeah. so like, for example, I, I read a lot and, uh, that, but that's how it is. Like you receive these like 20 to like 50 page long cyber threat intel deliveries. <laughs> someone needs to read this and someone needs to translate it to the company that they are working for. And that's a lot of time and effort. So mm. you are better if you're better off, if someone is actually helping you translating those, uh, you know, messages to your company instead of you reading these reports all the time because that's a mm. lot of time cool well Tibor I'm looking forward to it we will see you in November yeah see you there Ron Brash welcome to the podcast thank you very much nice to be here what are you talking about at this year's conference and why is it important well I, I, I try to make I try to make every topic a fun topic so I like to put a little bit of a twist on it and the reason why I'm coming to this conference is to talk about one of my passions uh, and obviously I've made a career and a living out of that passion, but my, my conversation will be about software builds and materials, but what really goes into the deconstruction of it. So I'm gonna talk about the two approaches. There's kind of two uh, main approaches out there, software composition analysis and binary composition analysis. But I'm also gonna talk about what efforts go into being able to deconstruct uh, industrial software artifacts from decades past. Stuff that might've been forgotten, stuff that is proprietary. And so I'm going to talk about my methodologies on that and all these cool things I've learned over time um, and how to identify and distinguish from one to another, what patterns might emerge. And so uh, kind of spinning on that, you know, the, to the topic of the conversation is going to be Dr. Strangelove or how I learned to be a former archaeologist and love the S-bomb or, or something along those lines. So kind of a number of takes <laughs> and a bit of a hat tip to uh, Alan Friedman, who's kind of a, a godfather of S-bombs, if you will. And I'm just going to keep it fun and, and trying to engage all the different types of audiences, whether it's technical to a lay person to someone who's just a risk advisor. I'm going to try and keep it interesting for everybody. And for us that are not so familiar with S-bombs, right? You're supposed to have an S-bomb or it's nice to have an S-bomb because then you know what's a part of whatever you're building. You have, the, you have the building blocks of what you've built. And if there's a vulnerability in front of them, then you're 
to know that it's there, correct? Uh, along, Is there anything I'm missing It's there? along those lines. Think of it like an ingredients list. Uh, some people might convolute the term S-bomb. It's kind of like a magic word these days in marketing. So really what it is mm. to us, it's an ingredients list. It's a, it's a description of all of the components that are in there. So for example, if you looked at North American uh, products, you'd see the word sugar. What they're actually saying is corn syrup, right? So it, it doesn't really tell you something or it doesn't say that it's quite, it's modified. That's not what S-bombs are. They're just an ingredients list. And so depending on the, the environment or the audience that you happen to be in, whether you're an asset owner, a vendor, uh, a supplier to a vendor or a security company in the middle, that's kind of looking at this for different information, they all have very different, diff different distinct and uh, sometimes overlapping purposes of how they might use that data. So really what I'm gonna be talking about is not just having that ingredients list, but also how does one get there accurately? How does one get to the point, especially for binaries that have been, you know, from companies that have been sold, bought out, end of life, uh, the build mm -hmm. chains are gone. How do you go backwards and build an S-bomb for those? That's really where, um, where I spend most of my efforts. And so I've, there's a whole historic learning process there that, that I didn't plan on uh, undertaking in my life. I didn't plan on becoming a librarian or, or archeologist of file formats. And so I just wanted to kind of show people that passion and, and show how hard it is. Anybody can make a software build materials from source code. It's a lot harder to build it in a system of system or something that's already been released. So that, that's where I like, to, I like to shine on that is take a hard topic and, and make it fun and show people there is another way. If you can make S-bomb sexy, I'll be I'm very happy. <laughs> I'll try. I'll try. I'm going to get you a beer when you do it. Perfect. <laughs> Andrada Sun. Hi. Hello. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Nice to see you again. Likewise. My favorite. Uh, do you don't get you don't get offended when people call you a headhunter. Do you? No, no, no I'm not. I'm in any way. I mean, recruiter, headhunter, whatever, whatever works. Uh, it's fine for me. But you are presenting at this year's Industrial Security Conference. I am. What are you going to talk to us about then? I guess we were going to talk about the elephant in the room. Uh, everyone talks about the lack of resources in general. And then the cybersecurity industry is, is even more bleeding from, from not having uh, the right people with the right competences. But when it comes to industrial security, that's even more of a specialized area where you almost can't work if you're not an engineer or if you have any form of uh, education related to how to handle the production environment and, and what to do and trainings regarding that. And, and, and that's a problem because the opinions have been a lot uh, spread in the industry. Like the people that already are industry in industry mean that if you don't have an engineering background or some sort of a uh, previous knowledge from working in a, in a production environment is going to be very, very hard, if not impossible to gather the resources and the knowledge necessary security wise to be able to help from that point of view. Mm. Um, and there are some that are saying, well, there is a lot of education out there and there is a, there are brainy people that don't need to be engineers or, you know, uh, uh, users mm -hmm. of production environment uh, technologies in order for 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 them to learn security. So so it's a matter of yeah, figuring out what exactly is the need and and how can we find um, different solutions and different way of thinking um, and and filling out the roles or the gaps that are required. Martin Shea. Yes. Welcome back to the podcast. <laughs> Thank you. Hello, Robbie. The 14th, 15th, and 16th of November, I have the pleasure of seeing you on stage. Yes. What are you going to be talking about at this year's conference? The topic is incidents uh, response in substations. Um, mm. So for yeah. that, we need to sure. lay first like a trace, you know, something they can later on search for. Um, mm. Kind of what maybe uh, an, a malware would do, you know, like a software. And, mm. and they have to figure it out, yeah. How do you imitate an electrical substation? I start thinking of things like digital twins and stuff. Is that, is that relevant or am I making it too complex? <laughs> that is very relevant. No, but actually we go in a, in a real substation. We, we just take part of it. I mean, some devices, not all, you know, because normally you don't have all available for doing mm. tests. Uh, for example, when they have an upgrade or they do something new, then we do... Um, uh, the, the three, four devices we have, we do it on on them. Cool. Mm. 
what are some of the um, difficulties when you're doing those sort of exercises? What what what's uh, what are some of the hard parts? Yeah, the hard part is is actually the hardware, like what, what you mentioned, because in a in a digital twin is kind of hard, yeah, to do, you know, because it's never really the same. I mean, in the environments mm. I I I've uh, been, and then the second difficult is part to to do to not disturb the actual uh, uh, operation. Eh? You don't want to turn off the light of the village or the town uh, because you did the incidence response exercise. I would assume that you've been doing this in real environments or doing this with other different companies in your area. Do you have any uh, any lessons learned from those? Preparation is, is very important, you know, that, that everybody is aware what you're going to do. So once you're inside the substation, everybody knows, let's say, the limit, you know, like which devices uh, they can check and which they are not allowed to touch. So that is mm. key. And out of it often comes, you know, you, you start to realize different, let's say, language, you know, like uh, the electrical engineers that uh, talk a bit differ different than the guys from the SOC uh, team. So that is all the mm -hmm. time very interesting when you kind of can align uh, afterwards, you know, when you uh, discuss lesson learned and all this. Right. That must be very healthy for the, um, the ego of the security team because usually nobody understands us, but now it's us that doesn't understand. <laughs> exactly. I think that's, that uh, that that's is exactly the point. <laughs> that is very interesting to see. Then they realize, oh, and we also cannot work in the same way like, you know, we are used to work. We really have to be cautious with uh, what we touch. We, we cannot just reboot any device we like, you know, or <laughs> I, I mean, in the mm. incidents response, you connect to uh, take the locks out maybe or even there you have to be careful that you don't do something uh, wrong you know otherwise i mean on the wrong device uh, especially yeah right do you see companies having a 24 7 team dedicated to ot environments now or mm, what are you no not 100 percent. but maybe switzerland is too small for it you know like uh, the mm. <laughs> organizations we have here they uh, of course they have a sock for the whole company but dedicated ot um 24 7 available i, I don't think so so I guess that's part of your exercise then, right? That's kind of what you teach them to practice is how do you exactly. take an alarm coming from that system and make sure the right people get put onto it? Yes, exactly. Especially the cool. SOC people with not much OT background, you know, that they learn uh, at which point they have to call the, the, the OT security engineer, for example. Dr. Maureen McWhite, welcome to the podcast. Hello, hello, hello. excited to be here. What do we get the pleasure of... Uh, hearing from you about at this year's conference? It's going to really uh, be around how to uh, detect timely the elimination of threats in our ICS environments. Mm, cool. Yeah. But uh, I also understood that you had like a, a twist towards uh, supply chain. Yeah, so my uh, so what I do in my business is I support uh, small and medium businesses um, in the supply chain sector. That's transportation. So I really specifically even narrowed it down and went toward transportation. So that's your maritime, trucking, air, and rail. So I will mm -hmm. be looking at it from that perspective: is how do we protect you know that, uh, that transportation layer within our industrial uh, control systems? Because that's very vital, very vital. Yeah. Is there any specific, uh, without giving away all your secret uh, sauce for your presentation, is there any anything like very specific about the transportation sector that makes it, uh, you know, more risky than others or? For me, the, the tra that makes it more attractive is what I like to say. Um, <laughs> well, because everything that everything that we do day to day, a lot of it is transported through our, you know, be it rail, be it maritime, mm. trucking. Trucking is big. And when I first started, it was really just the trucking. Everything moves by trucking. Uh, so mm. much of our goods and services. So, um, you know, if someone, I mean, we saw it when the, what was that? And I can't remember all the details. I just, with the ship, and I can't remember the name of the ship that got uh, catty cornered there. Ever, in the Evergreen, oh. Everglade, ever something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, <laughs> and, do, do you see the impact that that made with us getting you know our basic needs as well as some of the other things mm. that we like you know electronics and you know whatever so just an end you know if you really want to cripple and stifle uh, a, a community or a, a world or a nation 
tap into that transportation where stuff is coming in, how you move their goods and services in and out. I guarantee they're going to buckle. So, something's going to happen. Mm. So we really do need to look at and pay attention. How do we protect it? And especially now that we're talking autonomous, a lot of things are going to time. We have mm. autonomous trucking. Uh, we're talking autonomous uh, ships. And, you know, so with all of that now coming into our um, environment, we really need to understand not only the impacts, but how to protect our Hmm. And I would also assume not, you know, assume very big assume in the capital letters <laughs> that uh, the transportation sector probably wasn't like the they're not known as the first movers, you know, the, the, the highest willing to invest, I guess, but they still have a very exactly. important function. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Not the, not the first. Not always thought of. And uh, you know, a lot of people do. Uh, I remember when I was you know first working in this industry, and they're like trucking, cybersecurity. Why do trucks need cybersecurity? They just take <laughs> stuff from one point, and I'm like, believe me, if I really kind of, if you just want to sit down and talk to me, and we can go through it, you, you will understand why it's important. And so now, uh, now that we've had more cyber attacks, you know, within our supply chain transportation industry, and people are starting to now say, oh okay, we need to do something. Um, Mm. So it's slowly coming around, but we definitely need to understand what that is. Very interesting. Last question. So are you taking, um, are you focusing on the supply chain to the transportation industry? Are you taking a standpoint in like the the transportation industry as being a supply chain to some, some other industry? If that made that any sense at all. Yeah, it did. I got what you were saying. I got it. Yeah, it was the supply chain, the transportation sector to the industry. So not separate, okay. but how you know how all of that encompasses because it really does work together. It really does it work does. together. Yeah, it does. Yeah, we we definitely noticed that when that boat was um, stuck wherever it was stuck. Yeah, there, the was, coffee got more expensive. There was no yeah. things in the store. It was uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. And even during COVID, I don't know how it was over there in Denmark, but, you know, over here in the States, you know, you only could get like one thing of this or maybe two of those because things weren't moving as frequently mm. as they were. There there was no scheduled deliveries. And so, I mean, again, transportation, our transportation sector supply chain plays a huge part in our daily lives. Yeah. Well, I'm looking forward to it. Me too. We'll see you soon. Yes. <laughs>